This next lecture is on enculturating liturgical music. And we're going to begin with the beginning. And it is the first council of the church. And what they had to deal with was circumcision. I'm going to read to you from the Acts of the Apostles in the 15th uh, chapter. Some who had come down from Judea were instructing the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the Mosaic practice, you cannot be saved. Because there arose no little dissension and debate by Paul and Barnabas with them, it was decided that Paul, Barnabas, and some of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and presbyters about this question. They were sent on their journey by the church and passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, telling of the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church as well as by the apostles and the presbyters, and they reported that what God had done with them. But some of them from the party of the Pharisees, who had become believers, stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the Mosaic law. The apostles and the presbyters met together to see about this matter. After much debate had taken place, Peter got up and said to them, My brothers, you are well aware that from early days God has made God made his choice among you that through my mouth the Gentiles will hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness by granting them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them, for by faith he purified their hearts. Why then? Are you now putting God to the test by placing on the shoulders of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that they are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they. The whole assembly fell silent and they listened while Paul and Barnabas described the signs and wonders God had worked among the Gentiles through them. After they had fall sil fallen silent, James responded, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon, Peter, has described how God first concerned himself with acquiring from among the Gentiles a people for his name. The words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written, After this I shall return and rebuild the fallen hut of David. From the ruins, from its ruins, I shall rebuild it and raise it up again, so that the rest of humanity may seek out the Lord, even all the Gentiles, on whom my name is invoked. Thus says the Lord, who accomplishes these things, known from of old. It is my judgment, therefore, that we ought to stop troubling the Gentiles who turn to God, but tell them by letter to avoid pollution from idols, unlawful marriage, the meat of strangled animals and blood. For Moses, for generations now, has had those who proclaim him in every town as he has been read in the synagogues every Sabbath. What does this mean, this reading from the Acts of the Apostles? What, what you heard was Peter uh, arguing one point, Paul and Barnabas telling about how the Gentiles had been touched by God and had been working wonders among the Gentiles. And then James, the other apostle, who speaks about God's uh, willingness to look beyond that and to call upon all nations to serve him. What you hear in this is a discussion of enculturation. How does one culture the Jews of the first century encounter non-Jews, Greeks, as, a, as they called them, the Gentiles, who are not Jewish. Obviously, this is a very um, <laughs> important aspect for the men uh, who are being converted to the new way, the Christian faith, should they be circumcised. As you can imagine, that many of them would have balked at such an idea. And James comes up with the solution that there is a circumcision of the heart, not of the flesh. This is our very first understanding of how the church can interact 
with different cultures. So now let's translate that into liturgical music. How, and we begin with this question, how is music considered holy? Is it by the words? Is it by everyone agreeing? Or is it because it's serious music? By its connection to the liturgical action, this is where we find how music is considered holy. And this is a direct quote from Sacrosanctum Concilium on the constitution of the sacred liturgy. Therefore, sacred music is to be considered the more holy, the more closely connected it is with the liturgical action. Whether making prayer more pleasing, promoting unity of minds, or conferring greater solemnity upon the sacred rites. That is our answer. Not by just mere words, and not because we all agree on it, and not because it is some kind of serious music. It is the connection to the liturgical action that makes music the more holy. There is only one star of the liturgy, and it's not the musicians, and it's not the priest. It's the community gathered in prayer. Can the music bear the gravity of the texts being conveyed? Think for a minute on the song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Some of you, if you're Protestant, maybe you've sung this in, in, or maybe in CCD, but it goes like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Very, very simple melody with not very complex words. Or consider this example on Christmas Day for a children's mass, singing happy birthday to Jesus. Right? It, neither one of those really make a whole lot of sense. Right? It's not necessarily connected to the liturgical action at the time and place. But it's also, it doesn't convey um, any kind of solemnity uh, on the rites. So we've talked about the historical enculturation with the issue of circumcision. There are many other issues of enculturation, but specifically about music, we have already discussed this part of it, and that is these early differences in music. And when Charlemagne was attempting to unite his the Holy Roman Empire, which he created out of the three different kingdoms in Europe to bring back the, um, the power of the Holy Roman Empire, you have him helping to create Gregorian chant by combining the different aspects of the Beneventan chant, the Roman chant, the Ambrosian and the Mozarabic and the Gallican chants. This is an important consideration in the way in which uh, we have found that music historically has been enculturated to approach all different uh, types of people. Now, this was specifically in Europe, but we're dealing with very, very disparate uh, groups of people in these three different kingdoms. And I'm oversimplifying uh, this, of course, but just for our sake to consider the ways in which it has been done in the past. The author brings up an issue about um, Jesus of Nazareth and how that some significances of uh, sacramental signs resist any kind of enculturation. So we can talk about Jesus of Nazareth, but what about Jesus of Nazareth, Pennsylvania. You can't have Eucharist with potato chips and Coke, right? That's, that's important to remember because some of these important signs would deny the fact that Jesus was a person born into particular time and place, right? And we have to acknowledge that. So, for a culture like uh, East Asian peoples where rice is so important and rice cake, you know, can you use rice instead of bread because bread really doesn't speak to their existence? No, you can't because Jesus in that time and space used bread and wine. So it's not that Jesus was some kind of generic man, but a particular one who lived and died in first century uh, Judea. 
It is important that the individual rites have a relation to the places where Christianity originated and the apostles preached. They were they are anchored in the time and place of the event of divine revelation. The Christian faith can never be separated from the soil of sacred events. And I think this is important to remember. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI said, um, we cannot separate these things from the sacred events, uh, from the choice made by God who wanted to speak to us to become a man, to die and rise again in a particular place and a particular time. Now, I want to use some visuals to get across this point. Some of you may have seen this image of Jesus. It's a very famous painting, a beautiful one. But if you look very closely at it, maybe some people wouldn't necessarily feel um, that it speaks to them. So what about an image like this? Can this not speak to people of a particular time and place? Has th does this take enculturation too far? Or what about this image? An African image. Jesus. Does this not speak to a certain uh, group of people who might need to be preached to? Is it okay to change the ethnicity of Jesus to then speak to, to someone in a particular time and place? Or consider this image of the nativity where you have Mary and Joseph and the child Jesus with an angel and the ox. And the, you can see that this is the nativity scene, Christmas scene. But they look as if they're Japanese. It's painted in that style from that perspective. Or consider this one of the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit depicted in a Native American uh, imagery. Or consider this image here. An actor who played Jesus in a recent film about the life of Christ. It looks pretty right on. However, he's Latino. Is this closest to the image of what Jesus actually looked like? Is that important? These are questions for us to consider as we think about enculturation. There is a balance between honoring the historicity of Christ, but then also, or the historicity of Jesus, the fact that he was a person in a time and place, but also understanding the idea of Christ the Son of God, who is eternal, right? Who can speak to people in different cultures and different times and places. And I think it's important that the church has recognized this by allowing different times and places to speak to their people in a particular way that would they would understand. And so for this reason, we look at um, some music examples. And Swain uses in his text this idea of gospel music. And for Swain, he has a very difficult time with um, music coming from other non-sacred um, origins. And for good reason, right? Because it carries so much uh, meaning, so much semantic, right? That's already there. You know, so a, a saxophone carries a certain kind of sound that is not from the church. And it never really was when the saxophone saxophone was you know conceived of concert music jazz music and for most americans today it would automatically connotate some kind of nightclub right however gospel music uh which is not catholic but does come from a spiritual and religious beginning and these spirituals um were sung by enslaved Africans um, as a means of coping with their situation of enslavement in um, the United States and as an expression of their newfound faith in Christianity. And so they used songs. There's one that I think of um, very readily, and it's called Keep Your Lamps Trimmed and Burning. And this spiritual uh is on its face about the ten virgins who were 
Um, the nine virgins who were not ready for the coming of the bridegroom and the one who had enough oil in her lamp who was ready when the bridegroom came. Um, but African-Americans sang this song, Keep Your Lamps Trimmed and Burning, as a means uh, of faith on one level, but maybe on a more significant level, it was about that your freedom will come, right? If you keep your lamp trimmed and burning, if you are ready to make a move, then you can gain freedom as well from this situation of slavery. And so gospel music provides a unique uh, American uh, window into music that is that comes from a spiritual place. It comes from a difficult place too, but it comes from a spiritual place, but that is also specifically American that's different from, say, Gregorian chant or European hymnody. And now let's talk about understanding musical language. And I think this is important um, that you can realize just by listening to someone that's really, really bad. Uh, I think of way back when, when American Idol was, was coming out. Maybe, you know, The Voice has some of these kinds of things. But when American Idol came out, they would, you know, air these horrible singers, you know, who would go in front of the judges thinking that they were really great. But there was this one guy named William Hung who came out and he was awful. And it was readily apparent that he was really, really bad. And when the judges told him that he was really bad, he was like, oh, okay, well, I didn't know that. And it was this really beautiful moment. But what's important for us to understand is that you, without knowing anything about music, you know when something is good or bad. There's an intuitive understanding without any kind of musical education that you need that you know what is good and bad. So liturgical music need not be mysterious. We can know what is good and what is bad. And I think over the course of this semester, you have heard those kinds of things, right? So that's important to keep in mind. So let's consider some examples from different cultures. We'll start with, um, since Amy is with us in Japan, I think, um, this first time, let's consider some examples from Japan. There's a very simplistic nature to um, Japanese liturgical music. And we consider that uh, Christianity was completely banned um, in 1587. So prior to 1587, there were some Christians in Japan. But after that, the, the Meiji had, um, or I should say before the Meiji Restoration, there was a complete ban of Christianity from 1587 all the way up to 1868. And, you know, as you can see there, suspected Christians were forced to step on an image of Christ to demonstrate they were not members of the church. Um, so maybe when we come together and talk, uh, maybe, Amy, if you have an experience of uh, Catholic music in Japan, that would be very helpful um, if you could help us with that. I know you're still adjusting to the time there in Japan. Liturg culture and liturgical music. So every culture is flawed. Uh, none is, you know, the optimal Christian culture, right? So, or whatever. I mean, I, I use that facetiously. But a proper musical enculturation goes beyond mere adoption of local styles fitted to a vernacular translation of the Mass. No, a true enculturation will entail conversion, some kind of um, of change, of metanoia, uh, a purification of attitudes and practices from those which are not conformed to the gospel. So the question then becomes, can enculturation work everywhere? Some technical characteristics of native music may not cooperate with the Roman rite. Setting of the words to local folk music um, Sometimes it does not constitute a, a discrete category that will work within the context of the liturgy. Maybe those musics that don't work in the context of the liturgy can be used for personal prayer. An important consideration. And so let's now consider some directives from the church. 
This quote is from the Congregation of Divine Worship from 1974. How good it would be to develop a music that was neither theirs nor ours, but belonged to everyone and allowed the Catholic celebration for which we long. That brings up the point of Gregorian chant. It really does not belong to anyone. It is simplistic in its form. It's malleable and it allows for global, <laughs> read Catholic, uh, participation by all cultures. So using Gregorian chant as a meeting ground, uh, the author made the point about that about Latin as well being a, a meeting ground for all language groups that it, it's not anyone's own, right? Latin is, doesn't belong to any particular culture at this point. And he made the uh, he makes the point here as well about the use of Gregorian chant. It can be a unifying uh, thing because it doesn't belong to anyone. So in conclusion, liturgical music can be enculturated. It must meet the understandings of its worshipers, and true enculturation entails conversion. Sometimes there is semantic interference, which kind of can create this syncretism, right? That's the negative aspect of enculturation, where it's an amalgamation of local customs or religions. And plain chant can work because it is not ours and it is not theirs. It's nobody's. And in that sense, we have unity. <laughs>